Okay, um, I'm going to start this so that our, our artists will be able to have the most time to talk. Um, I wanted to welcome you today to the Alumni Artist Talk uh, with our guest artist, Mike Hooves, who's a BDES from 2016 in illustration, and Tyler Lemmermeyer, BFA 2006 in media arts. Um, my name is Marion Garden. I'm the Director of Communications and Marketing, and I was born and raised on Territory 6, um, Treaty 6 territory, and I'm really fortunate to live and work here today on Treaty 7 territory. And we're thankful that Alberta University of the Arts rests on the traditional Treaty 7 territories of the Blackfoot people, and in the spirit of our collective efforts to promote reconciliation, we acknowledge the traditional territories and oral and visual practices of the Blackfoot Confederacy, which includes Siksika, Pekani, and Kainai, the Tutina, the Stony Nakoda First Nations, which includes Bearspaw, Chiniki, and Wesley, and Mady Nation, Region 3, and all of those who make their homes and live and play in the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. Um, before I hand over to Tyler and Mike, um, please let me quickly explain what the mural project is. So to celebrate AUART's very first anniversary, when we transitioned from a university, from a college, we commissioned an alumni mural to go in the lower concourse hallway. And that very first mural was unveiled in 2020, and that was done by Nazarimba, a collective that had um, an alum named Mikhail Miller in that collective. Then in 2021, two more murals were commissioned in the lower concourse, and you're gonna hear about those today um, with our guest speakers, Mike and Tyler. And then in 2022, we just completed one more mural on the lower walkway to the car park, and that was by an alum, Sylvia Arthur, and Sylvia will be a future guest speaker to talk about that mural. Um, Tyler will talk today, he'll start. There'll be about five minutes for questions midway. Then we will go to Mike, who will take over, and we'll have another small question um, and answer period. And then at two, when the talk is finished, if you have time, please join Tyler and Mike. We're gonna go downstairs to the concourse and actually look at the murals, and you can ask more questions about the murals actually in person, looking at them. And um, yeah, and so I just wanna start this off and welcome Tyler. Our first alumni speaker, he's going to go first. Thank you. Can you guys hear me? Okay, cool. Uh, well, thank you so much for that introduction um, to the project and to myself. Um, I'll just go ahead and introduce myself again. I'm Tyler Lemmermeyer. I'm an illustrator, muralist, and I graduated in 06 from the Media Arts and Digital Technologies program. So I didn't really know where to start, so I thought I would just start with the piece itself. Um, so when I first attended AU Arts, um, I kind of struggled with identity. Uh, being that I came from a high school where I was one of the best artists in the school to coming to AU Arts and being just surrounded by so many talented individuals. So I kind of got lost in who I was, and, and, uh, but it wasn't before long that I found community and knew that this is kind of like the place where I belonged. So this piece kind of reflects like the different identities and the diversity that I kind of felt going to the school. Um, and just the playful nature of both the color palette and just the playful nature of kind of the faces kind of was meant to symbolize um, the welcoming environment of the space. Um, so here I study media arts and digital technologies program. Um, at the time, uh, it afforded a lot of freedom um, for you to kind of study so many different mediums like um, video, uh, sound design, digital illustration, um, as well, it had a lot of uh, freedom to expand, and I was able to kind of get in the wood, sh wood shop and explore sculpture um, and do printmaking and drawing. Um, but near the end of my education, I fell in love with animation, and then I went on to kind of pursue um, another uh, degree at Vancouver Film School where I studied digital design and kind of focusing on motion design, print design, and uh, interactive design. But Ultimately, when I kind of boiled everything down, illustration was my true passion, and I, I stuck true to that. 
Um, but when I graduated from this program, it was 2008, and there was hard economic times, and I had a hard time finding a job in the industry. So I kind of pursued another passion of mine, and I became a bike courier. So it was something I always wanted to do, and I always joked around how I would only do it for the warm months, and then um, when the snow started to fly, I'd find a job in the industry. But uh, I loved it so much, I stuck around for a long time. I ended up breaking a collarbone, not once, but twice one of the many job hazards of being a bike messenger. However, there's, you know, one of the perks of being a bike messenger, there's a lot of downtime, and I had the opportunity to spend that time sketching in sketchbooks when I was waiting in lines at banks or just waiting in between deliveries. So I draw buildings, I draw building interiors, I draw people, I draw couriers, I ended up drawing all of the couriers, so in this piece, I have um, all their names, how long they've worked, and their courier nicknames. That was one thing that was always kind of fun. But as I was doing this, I was posting to social media and kind of developing a following online and kind of starting to develop a network of uh, colleagues where um, I was invited to participate in a, a group show with artists and designers. Uh, it was a group show called Bats for Brats, uh, comprised of 10 artists where we de uh, decorated bats and auctioned them off, and the proceeds went to charity. Uh, I believe it was, um, uh, it was just for charity. I can't remember the charity right now. Um, but I was so stoked on this because it was my first opportunity to showcase my work in kind of a public space with you know, other art, being on the same tier as other artists. Um, but yeah, this piece, I, uh, I took all the baseball stadiums from them, uh, uh, MLB, and I oriented them on the, ball, on the baseball bat and kind of had true north facing at the end of the bat. Uh, shortly after that, the same organizers put on another other exhibition, and it was a bike poster show. And I thought how fitting that, you know, being my history as a bike courier, um, that I would be selected to participate. Um, so I was inspired by a courier that I used to work with, maybe not the same company, but he was just so serious, fixed gear, no brakes. And one day he flew by me and kind of looked over his shoulder as I was fixing my brakes on my bike and he uttered, no slow, only go, like a, like a cartoon. So that's, that's what inspired this piece. Um, I mean, it kind of looks more like this per se is kind of what I had it in my mind, but I ended up kind of revising this for the poster show. Um, from this point, I, I kind of decided that I was tired of breaking bones and I was getting you know, older and wanted to focus more of my energy towards my artistic practices. So with that, I was posting online. Um, you know, at ACAD, I was always instilled to keep a sketchbook and always how amazing it is to keep one because, you know, it's, it's a great place for working out your ideas. You don't have to worry about people judging you about, you know, your process or what you do and you're harnessing your craft. Um, but being that I like sharing my process online, um, I did have work similar to this, um, the backgrounds here, and an agency reached out and they had kind of a campaign that they wanted to feature that style of animation, or sorry, not animation, um, that style of sketching. Um, so then I, I went to create a series of tea towels with my sister. Um, it was a two, two colored screen printing uh, design where I kind of started to work more digitally using Illustrator. Um, this one, uh, we went through a lot of revisions to kind of develop the visual language on this one. And, you know, I got so good at it that I started to look out at the world and look at buildings and I used to think about how I would actually break that down in an Illustrator file and how I would draw it. Um, so, kind of going on the theme of just kind of continue to post, posting online, an old instructor of mine found, was following my process and invited me to participate in creating this um, resource to identify bees for the species that were at risk um, to identify subspecies of um, bees. Um, but I used it as an opportunity to work digitally with an illustration, kind of bringing that sketch style into you know, the digital realm and kind of use that as an opportunity to kind of pursue that practice. Um, but at each project, um, you know, I 
built my portfolio and new opportunities arose. This is an example of another digital illustration. I worked for, um, an, for an agency that was doing a rebrand and they required illustrations to you know, kind of um, complement their, their branding. Um, so Tourism France ended up reaching out to me to be an influencer for a campaign that they were working on um, to go to France and kind of basically do what I was doing as a bike courier and just sketching in my sketchbooks and um, encourage people or Canadian tourists to visit France. So I went um, to various different locations, the, the, the Louvre at the, in France and Vimy Ridge, um, and created these illustrations that I had to post online. Um, and it was really meant to, like I said, encourage people to go to France. But initially when I got this email, it was so out of the blue, I didn't even think it was real. I thought it was like some phishing scam or something. And I was just kind of playing along, kind of like half kind of in it. Uh, but it wasn't until I scanned my plane tickets that it was, that it, I, those feelings went away. So I, I'm sure you're aware, I don't know, I'm not sure if your instructors have kind of given you the heads up, but if you do pursue a, a life as a freelancer or an artist, that you're gonna have ebbs and flows, you're gonna have to be busy a lot of the time, or some of the time, and then you're gonna have long windows of drought, um, maybe not having much to do. So I, I kind of, I know it's frustrating, um, you know, being just left there with nothing to do. So I decided to challenge myself and create something every day for 100 days. Um, here, I just, I didn't really know what I was going to get out of it. I didn't really have a particular theme that I wanted to do, but I knew it was just a great opportunity to work on ideation, kind of like keeping a sketchbook, um, you know, improving my skills, um, and just getting things out. It's, it's, as a, I find as a freelance illustrator, you know, with no deadlines and no work, it's just, it's hard to create something. So this is why I thought this challenge was so important that I was able to, to create all these images. Um, and it wasn't until about later, later in the process where I kind of thought that it was successful because it led to a series of paintings that I ended up showcasing um, called Portraits of Notoriety, where I take old paintings and kind of make them fun. Um, and reinterpreted them in, in a fun way, kind of these paintings that you learn about in art history. So, and, and it really is intended to be just kind of playful and lighthearted and just get people excited about art. Meant to be playful and accessible. So, I always wanted to get into muraling. Um, one, one aspect of it, it was that it's accessible to anyone, there's no boundaries to have to go into an art gallery. You know, if you're on the street, you can see it. It's just, it's just available. And so I was invited to create this um, digital mural for Alberta Treasury Branch where, excuse me, um, where I created this uh, diverse scene of all these people which celebrated the diversity and of people and their occupations. Um, and I was so excited to be able to do that because it was kind of like a stepping stone um, to kind of get into that workplace. Um, how are we doing for time? So I'll try to speed this along. We're running a little short on time. Um, but yeah, so ultimately it led to my first mural, which Bump, um, YYC Bump, was uh, offering applications. And I got my first mural uh, back in their second year that they were operating. Um, it was my ode to cycling and to my many years as a bike messenger. Um, you know, it was, it was great. It was intimidating because it was such a big project, but it was great being able to work digitally because I could create um, these bike designs and kind of shift them around to kind of make um, the composition uh, the way I wanted to. And then eventually I projected it out to create this piece. But this is really where I, things started to pick up for me. I was in the public sphere. I was kind of outside of my social media, I don't know what you want to call that, but just following. Um, so I, I got a job doing a mural for the core fitness downtown. Um, but then one, one project that I was really excited was to be able to participate in this one. Um, it was a, a project with seven other artists, or four, sorry, six other artists to create kind of this interactive um, space where you could come and interact with the art, take photos in front of it and post that online. Um, these were some of the examples of people posting and posing in front of it. 
I was really just kind of to get foot traffic to South Center Mall, and it was a great success. Um, later on, I got to work with South Center again, creating um, this mural on kind of an unused hoarding space rather than just having a blank drywall or designed um, by a designer or an agency. They hired local artists. And then again, just kind of creating more, more spaces in commercial, commercial spaces. I had all these opportunities. Um, but Una, Una is a great one. Um, this is Una, a pizza place in Banff. They have one in Calgary, I believe. Um, but they kind of have a, a, a cycling um, artists. Um, so these murals are actually temporary and that I painted on old hardboard from a construction site um, and re reuse some of my old paint from old murals. So it's just a great way to kind of avoid these, these items ending up in the landfill. Here's another example of a commercial project I did for, you know, driving range, which kind of have it, had a feeling of a bowling alley. I just did finish this one up recently. Um, but yeah, so here, here's an example of, of a mural that, that took uh, me taking an application, submitting an application and, and receiving. It was for the Center Street, uh, for the Crescent Height community. There's that long stretch, I don't know if you're familiar with that long stretch of sidewalk. Before it was just this drab, drab walk up the hill which took longer than, than um, people actually thought it took. So I worked with Sidoni Warren and Corey Bugden and we applied together, weaving kind of our different styles along this 480 foot long mural. But one of the challenge of this mural was it was 480 feet long, so we had to utilize volunteers. And, and through that, I learned that you know, some volunteers aren't as great as others because you know, some volunteers are just excited to participate and they don't have any experience painting, so they might make mistakes. So you have to kind of just learn how to set those people up for success versus hiring assistants who have had a, um, experience painting murals or painting in general. Um, this was another example of a festival that I applied for and got. This was for Meet the Street in Red Deer. Um, and then while I was painting that, people were asked, or someone asked if I do commercial painting, so they asked me to paint their storefront in uh, northern Red Deer. But sometimes as an artist, um, there's not always a call for a mural, or people aren't always asking you to do work. So sometimes you just have to make your own opportunities. Sometimes you just have to reach out yourself. For this example, I reached out to Deerfoot City and I was like, hey, you got a lot of walls, I make art, why don't we, why don't we do something together? So sure enough, they were interested and we created this vinyl mural to cover an old storefront that wasn't developed yet. So this is one of my favorite projects I got to work on. It was with 19 Crimes and Snoop Dogg launching a wine together and they wanted to create an interactive or um, a sculpture to kind of celebrate the launch of it. So they invited artists from Vancouver um, Calgary and Toronto to make a, a similar kind of sculpture for the launch. And for this one, I kind of went back to my skills in, in the wood shop when I was here at school, fabricating this myself with the assistance of my father-in-law to hook up the weld or weld the, the frame and set up the lighting. But if you do have uh, the skill set to actually fabricate a project like this, it's definitely a bonus because then you kind of keep that money in your pockets rather than hiring a fabricator to do it for you. Uh, this was a project um, uh, I did with Park and we basically was promoting the, the collaboration or kind of the, the tandem launch of Calgary Independent Film Festival and Beakerhead. So they had, we, we had the periodic table of elements and branching off from that was kind of like a wayfinding experience to kind of lead you towards the theater. Uh, boom. Um, here's another project I worked with Park. Um, it's another one if you're interested in kind of doing this kind of thing to kind of look up. Um, but I had the opportunity to create these sculptures and paint these picnic tables. But it's uh, for a project or for an event called Block Party. And they've done this for three years and they're always using new artists and they're always looking for new ways to kind of create this vibrant kind of feeling and kind of bring people out to the space. Um, this is one of my most, um, the largest pro project I've worked on. Um, I worked with Venture, Venture and Park again, and I had the opportunity to work with F&D to fabricate this thing. Um, but it was created for the Alberta Bottle Depot to kind of encourage 
um, people to recycle their cans. Um, here we kind of made a gamification of, you know, Plinko board where you could win prizes and that created a touch point where, you know, people could spread awareness to make sure that people were recycling. Um, but as I kind of mentioned that, you know, I've worked with Park a bunch, uh, with a bunch of different projects in my, in my career. It's always important to have a good relationship with all of your clients, just in case you have, end up having residual work. So one, one thing I just kind of wanted to talk about was kind of how to get into muraling, if this is something that you're interested for. I kind of mentioned in the talk, always be looking for uh, RFPs or requests for proposals. Um, one thing to keep in mind is, you know, there's festivals all over the world, um, and they often have uh, yearly openings for applications to submit um, your work and to get into them. So become familiar with those. I mean, you can, um, Bump, I believe, has a mentorship program where you can either offer your assistance to assist other artists or just kind of learn, learn or be, be involved. Um, but I know sometimes these mural opportunities come, they ask for experience, and sometimes you can create mock-ups, and not necessarily everyone has to know that they're mock-ups. Um, this could be one way that you, or you could just, you know, go somewhere and paint a mural on an old decrepit chicken coop, like I did. If you just want to go paint something, go paint something. Um, it's just really about putting yourself out there and, 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 and going through the hoops. If you have to, you know, paint on a piece of plywood and stick it to your fence, um, you know, it's just important to get out there and paint. I know you're probably here looking to pursue your passion. Um, maybe you're looking to discover it. And if you don't discover it here, you know, that's okay too because AU Arts is just such uh, an amazing um, environment to learn in and you have that opportunity to learn and fail in such a safe space. Um, you know, some people might not find their passion later in life. And, you know, it's kind of like me. I, I thought I was um, a little bit lost. And then, you know, illustration I found kind of later on. But with that, I'd just like to say thank you and open it up for questions. Um, and, yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Yes. Hi. Uh, Richard Brown. Yes, I remember. Yeah. <laughs> um, really great to see this, and really great to see like what's been happening with your work and your career. Thank you. Um, so thanks very much for this. Uh, I, I was wondering, like, yeah, you know, in the case of like that bottle depot piece that you made, yeah. you know, three-dimensional kind of thing out in the public space. How much are you responsible for like any health and safety stuff, or permits around that, or dealing with? So, uh, so yeah, the question is just basically how responsible am I for the safety of everyone? I don't know if you've heard it. Um, so with that project in particular, being that there are a lot of kind of um, chefs in the kitchen, I guess I could call it, but basically, there's, so there's Venture Communication, which was the ad agency. There was Park Productions that I worked with, or basically produced it, and then I was kind of the, the artist designer. So I, I think I was kind of lower down the chain, so I didn't have to wor worry so much about, let's say, health and safety. So we actually... Um, had F and D fabricate that, so they're a big fabrication shop that you know create um, experiences for like Stranger Things. So they're they they're I think I'm pretty sure they're insured, so that would probably be, co be covered under their insurance and liability. So they actually so I created a mock up for them, and then they actually created um, three dimensional drawings from that, and that way uh, it was up to code. And behind it, there was actually um, scaffolding, scaffolding which with stair with a stairwell, which I didn't show. But does that answer your question? Yeah, to a certain so degree. In most cases. Yeah. So I mean, for, uh, with with a project with 19 crimes, um, I was kind of, I would have been on the hook for that. But that's where having I guess one thing I didn't talk about in the presentation is having commercial liability insurance. A lot of these projects and clients will request two to five million dollars of liability insurance, and that's just something that you should probably have as an artist. I'm, I don't really know the ins and outs of that. I just I have it myself, just you know, to cover my bases. But yeah, when you get into 
I guess, sculpture and, and that, that's, you definitely need to have certification so you know, your sculpture is not tipping over, or catching on fire. Cool, I guess that's it. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm here, I mean, that's my QR code. You can reach out anytime if you feel the need. Um, I'm happy to answer emails or questions on social media. Um, but if, uh, without further ado, I, I think I'll hand it over to Mike and he can, uh, he can share with you what he's uh, done. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, you can. Awesome. Hello, everybody. My name is Mike. You might have seen me yesterday if you were at the orientation. I uh, work part-time at the Students Association just across the way. All right. So I am going to talk about um, making my mural today for Vivid. OK. It's kind of like a little recipe. <laughs> Okay, so uh, the quick and dirty about me is I attended AU Arts from 2011 to 2016 for illustration. So I've been out of school for six years, but I, I still consider myself relatively new. Um, I don't know how well I did in school. I didn't thrive, but I persevered. And I persevered until I started thriving probably like a year or two ago. So um, I started getting murals recently. Um, 2020, and I feel like a lot of the stuff I learned is finally like making sense in my brain now from school, which is great. So my first mural was painted in 2020, and I'll show a picture of that on the next thing. Um, but I actually benefited a lot from COVID with murals. Um, because of COVID, uh, we couldn't gather, so a lot of clients were looking for murals, um, and I was able to kind of slip in in that time. Uh, so my work, it's uh, gestural, figurative, uses bright colors, bold shape language. Uh, I'm really into simplicity. Uh, I think it's because I'm lazy, <laughs> but it's also an interesting challenge to see um, how you can simplify something and still convey the same message. So um, some murals. Uh, I did bump last year, so Tyler mentioned bumped. They actually have these like little roadblock murals. You've probably seen them. But if you're like, if you've never painted a mural before, that's a good place to start. I painted five of those last year, um, and that really helped because generally to get a mural, people want you to have mural experience, but if you don't have any, where do you start, right? So bump is really great, um, a great place to start with those little guys. Um, painted the like little stuff in, the, in retail, little figures. That goat one is new, so I painted, I was telling Marion, but I painted four murals last month. So definitely picking up now. Um, a little bit from a window mural. So if you can't tell, I like like very bright colors. Um, and I also like painting at AU Arts, even when I'm not a student. I like being here, period. But Vivid, uh, the call for submissions came out last year. So I thought, hey, I'm going to apply. I've applied for a lot of things, and I haven't gotten them, but I'm going to keep applying for things because perseverance. Um, so in the call, you know, when you get a call for a mural, um, you have to consider like what your mural is going to be a lot of the time. It's not a good idea to just like be like, I'm going to fart out a drawing for no reason and it's going on this wall. You want to think about the location of your mural uh, and you want to think about like the perception of this area. So location, you know, where is it? What's the significance of this location? So. For the vivid murals, they're in that hallway, that corridor. And so I thought about that. It's indoors. Um, the doors below the mural are a direct route to outside in the C train. So who's going to be seeing and interacting with that? For the most part, it's folks, students especially, coming from AU Arts, going home or grabbing lunch, you know, uh, people leaving from the Jubilee after a show. So. Um, Tyler's was more like you're entering as well. You know, you're seeing that as you enter, and mine was when you're leaving and you're kind of winding down or you're taking a break from your schoolwork. So I really wanted to put that in consideration when I was applying. Uh, and then, just like some inspiration for uh, after I made these considerations. 
So uh, first and foremost, my experience as a student here really informed my uh, mural. So that's a little picture of me back in the day with cats. Um, but I passed through those doors a lot. So I really tried to think back about how I was feeling when I was going through those doors. And a lot of the time, it was almost like closure. You're, you're leaving for the day, or you're grabbing lunch, so rest. Um, I really like uh, the muralist artist Keith Haring um, and how dynamic and colorful his work is. Uh, I really enjoy how universal his imagery is. You can show it to pretty much anyone and they can relate to it. Uh, another muralist I really like is uh, Ness Lee. She's from Toronto, but she has a very like gentle, tender, gestural quality to her work, even though it's quite, the figures are quite still. Um, so I wanted to kind of draw from that energy. Of course, the C train map, because the C train, I don't know about you, but I was really broke and I would take the C train all the time. Uh, and then for me, I uh, would take the C train um, and it would go over the Bow River every day. So that was a big landmark. And the Bow is just like, to me as a Calgarian too, just such a central landmark. So these were some of the things I considered when I was making my image as well. So um, when building my concept, it, it, or building a concept for a pitch, especially a site-based piece of art or work, it's really essential that you mock it up in the space so that you understand the context of the image and also so someone else who's viewing your application understands it as well. You know, it's a lot easier than trying to explain the image in the space, just putting it in the space. So, I, there was a picture on the Instagram that was like, oh, call for submission. So I just took a screenshot of that. And then this is my first draft, my, my little Nike people. So pretty much it's in the space. I even redrew the space because I, I wanted it to be like cohesive. It's just more pleasant to look at for whoever is jurying it as well. Um, so I got accepted, which was great. Um, we put some clothes on them just because uh, graffiti, you know. So this is the this was kind of the final image I went with. And with murals, it's really important a lot of the time to have your image finalized before you start painting. There's like a tiny little bit of room to improvise, um, unless you're doing like graffiti or something. But usually, you want to have your image like created and ready to go, so you know what you're doing when you're getting on site. So. Once that was all approved, it was time to make the mural. So exciting, ready to paint. No, not yet. So <laughs> you have your logistics to deal with, and Tyler talked a bit about this for, as well. Um, you, you have to deal with like the paperwork, uh, the like cat herding if you have assistance. So some of the stuff I just listed, it. this is some of the stuff you have to trudge through to get to the painting. So you need liability insurance, um, like Tyler said. So if, if like a, if paint knocked on someone's head and they sued you for a million dollars, they would be, the insurance would pay it out and they wouldn't sue me or AU Art. So most places when you paint for them, they'll be like, listen, do you have liability insurance? So you need to get that. Um, admin stuff to ensure you get paid, that's always very important. Usually happens before the mural. Um, the scissor lift, so Tyler and I worked together to book a scissor lift because Painting murals is expensive. Any way you can save money is good. And one of those ways for us was we booked some stuff together. So working together to arrange our dates to have the scissor lift. Tyler painted his mural before me and then I came in a few days after and then started painting mine so that we could each use the lift. Um, we also arranged for an anti-graffiti top coat on our mural. So again, we went in on that together to save money and that's just a a coat of painting, clear paint, that goes on top. If there's graffiti, if it's graffiti, you can actually remove that top coat and it'll remove the graffiti with it. So that's a really valuable thing um, to put on murals in like very public places. A lot of outdoor murals have it as well. Um, setting dates and times to paint. So you know with the scissor lift and with anti-graffiti, you really have to like lock in dates. Something I've learned with murals, I'm a very like go with the flow, but with murals it's like about scheduling and knowing I'm going to be painting these days at this time. 
And it goes back to location too, right? Like what time's the building open? Um, is the building gonna be busy? Are people gonna be walking through those doors and so I can't paint? Stuff like that. Um, location consideration plays into how you schedule. Uh, purchasing all your supplies, you really want to make sure you have everything before you start painting because the last thing you want is to start painting and then you realize you're missing a bucket of paint. So I use Benjamin Moore paints, I really like the color on those, so I went down there, got my drop cloths, got my paint. I have a checklist I keep because I will forget if I don't have that checklist. So I'm like, painter's tape, paint, each color, drop cloth safety harness, because um, the scissor lift, you can't just go up there and like walk around. You have to be harnessed into it, um, and so that's something you have to have as well. And then we had assistance for this project, which I, um, this was my biggest mural I'd painted to date too, so for me it was pretty big, but I had never had assistance before, so uh, that was big, and they are actually uh, AU Arts students at the time, so AU Arts reached out to them and asked if they wanted that paid opportunity to work with us. So Tyler and I, again, we agreed to just share those assistants. So I need to give them the dates after I figured out the dates I was gonna paint. And then for me, um, how I painted was I used a projector. So I need to arrange, starting out, I used a projector and like traced it. I need to arrange that as well. So lots of stuff to get to the painting. Um, and here is my day one of painting. So I did this by myself. I didn't need assistance at this point. But a few things I had to do, put signage out. Usually your insurance too will be like, you need to put signage. So I wasn't just doing it to be nice. It's like a legal requirement. So placing signage in certain areas, letting people know, hey, we're painting a mural. Um, it's good to put like your Instagram handle and stuff on those too, if you're thinking ahead of time because people will ask you, oh, what's this for? Who are you? How do I find you? So it's like a double whammy. Tell them you're painting, put your branding on there. Uh, tape everything off you don't want paint on with painter's tape. So that's what I'm doing in the top left. Uh, and then project the image on the wall. So you can see like, this is, I had it on my tablet and then I was projecting it onto the wall. And then basically tracing things with their corresponding colors so it became like a paint by numbers. So when my assistants came in, it was easy to explain and easy for them to understand. This is, this is in pink lines, fill it with pink. Um, so there's me with my little hard hat working away. Uh, one thing that was kind of challenging was uh, because it was so bright, it was hard actually to see the projection. So I had to like get close a lot of the time and squint. But um, projection, if you can, sometimes you can't because of the size of the wall. Projection makes things a lot faster. Freehanding on a wall is like the worst thing to do if you already have the image because the scale will make things wonky and then you'll be working on it forever. So that's why I have that image made before too so that I can just like go. Um, day two to four, painting. So there's me and my cool harness in the AUR's bathroom. And my assistants here, Terry and uh, Natalia, we painted daily from 11 to four. So again, having that schedule. And both of them had different uh, skills and abilities. So I let them paint the first day and kind of like just watch to see like what they were good at. And then day two and three, I was able to say like, hey, Terry, you're good at dry brushing and making these edges kind of soft. I'm gonna get you to do that. And Talia, you're good at filling things in fast and doing crisp lines. I'm gonna get you to do this. So you have to learn really quickly with assistance to delegate because uh, otherwise they're just standing waiting for you to tell them something and then you're wasting your own time and money. So there's some more like little work in progress shots. It was really important and it's important with any mural, you know, you're so close painting it to like step back. And so for me, I would like run all the way to the end of that hallway and just like, does it look good? Yeah, it looks pretty good. It looks like my picture. Um, you can see the scissor lift there too, our little scissor lift guy. You have to be certified to use that as well, so that was something that we had to do beforehand. Um, there's little coffee cups in the bottom, so that's like a little trick I learned. You, you never want to carry a whole 
thing of paint up with you, right? So I found that using little coffee cups that you can put the lid on um, is really useful because you can seal them and the paint doesn't dry in them. All oh, right, so this was uh, my final image. So you can probably see like the sea train motifs and the, the Bow River. For the most part, it stayed um, pretty similar to my concept. There were a few things I changed as I went. Um, again, there was a little, I left a little room for like improving and being like, this image was really small on the screen and I was working on that. And even with the concept when you blow it up, it's not quite the same as when you start painting on the wall and stepping back and being like, this doesn't work. Like the dotted lines on the C train thing, it didn't work. So there was stuff like that. Um, but for the most part, I tried to keep it quite similar. It takes a lot longer than making a little image. So my takeaways, or my top three takeaways is I learned that prep, prep everything. It's like that quote, uh, measure twice, cut once. So lots of prep to set yourself up for less work. I really, uh, I really made sure I lined my P's and Q's with this one, because uh, the last thing you want to do when you're painting is have to stop to like deal with buying more supplies or consider something you didn't. So you want to try and have all that considered. And if you can have that considered in the application too, that'll make it more successful. I tried to be really thorough in my application about what my plan was each day, what supplies I had, what I needed to succeed, and things like that. So if you have that in the beginning, it'll make the rest of it a lot easier, including the application. Uh, assistance, that was huge. I hire assistants all the time now. Before I was like a little stingy and I was like, oh, I don't want to pay. Like, but they, for each assistant you have, they cut your time in half. So obviously this is my biggest wall. So I learned really quick that there's a lot to cover and having those assistants. Yeah, I had two. So they cut my time in half twice, whatever the math is on that. Third did it. <laughs> um, and this too, actually, I didn't think I was going to get this. I never assume that I'm going to get things. I don't get a lot of things. But what I've been learning the past few years is you only need a couple yeses against like a ton of no's. So apply for things you don't think you'll get if you have the capacity. Don't just apply for everything and do a bad job on your application. If you have the capacity to apply for things and you know you can do a good job on the application, apply for it. Um, and if you don't get it, sometimes, like bump, I've had friends apply for bump and not get in the first time. Sometimes it's just that your art isn't fitting what they want at that time. So don't be afraid to like reapply for things you get told no for as well. So this one, it was like, oh, I got it, which is great. For every like 10 no's, you only need one yes. And so that's, that's been like my game of numbers. But again, if you have the capacity, don't just like apply for everything and do a bad job. Here's my funny photos, because uh, something I've, I feel really awkward in front of a camera. That's what I've learned. I'm like, there I am, like, surprised. We had a, uh, that was one other thing. Tyler and I hired, a or we worked together to get a photographer, which is really beneficial. And they made a video as well of us talking about our work. Um, but yeah, so that was our like final photos, which is great. Documenting your work is really valuable too for like social media and stuff. Even those pictures I had of day by day, like taking even one picture, a little video, right? That's all content. So once the mural is done, it's good to like share photos, um, put it on your website. But that's uh, that's like the whirlwind version of how I painted this mural. So that's the end. <laughs> yeah, any questions? Yeah. Hi, Mike. Thanks for the presentation. Yeah, no problem. Thanks. Uh, I have two questions. Oh, yeah. Uh, so the first question is for you, and then the second might be for both you and Tyler. OK. I'm learning it is. Like, even while I was painting this, I, I wasn't using social media to its full potential, but it's really, 
important. I was just saying to Marion, like I took pictures of Tyler talking and me here because you kind of you got to like continuously keep yourself relevant to remind people that you exist. Even like I know some really amazing artists and they don't care for social media, which is good for them, but it's not good if you want to be public facing and have people approach you. And social media, I get gigs out of social media too. So for example, I just had a show, a reception for a show at Cafe Clatch. It's still open, called Trans is a Flower. And I put money into social media too. I was like, I'm gonna pay for an ad too and post constantly. And I got over 60 people come to my reception, which is like, they were like, yeah, I saw it all over social media. So it's, <laughs> I, I don't like social media. I don't know many artists who do, but yeah, it, it keeps you relevant. So. Making art now, you know, I just want to make art, but then I have to think about, like, take a picture, take a video, um, because it's really valuable, and it's gotten me to people who wouldn't engage with my work otherwise. Same with having murals out. Like, ha having a mural out on a wall is its own form of social media too, right? Because you have people you'd never even interact with on social media who see the wall, see your name, and then they email you or they find you somehow through Google. So. Social media, it's a, like a necessary evil, I find, if you're a freelancer. Unless you somehow just know a network of people outside of that, but most of us are on there now, right? So it's, yeah, it's really important. I'm finding out the power of TikTok lately. I was very scared of it for a long time, and the reach on that is incredible compared to Instagram even. So like, still learning stuff, and learning that it's it's a part where I have to like take an hour and just like make a video, put it out uh, once a week, even. Yeah, part two. You want to go first, sure. Tyler? So yeah, that's a great question, and definitely a great thing to consider in your work. You guys all can know how I like So that actually happened to me before. Mm -hmm. I actually, I don't know if I'm legally allowed to talk about it, but I had a particular client, uh, but I had them sign a contract. So actually, the uh, the one with the Hondas and the sketchy background um, was actually a, a, an agency which was notorious. actually take on a project where um, I did 100% of the work, the final design was approved, but somewhere in the, in the fold, the client decided to go in a different direction. So I was so relieved just because I didn't have to have the conversation, well, I made all the work, so now you gotta pay me. It's literally written out in the contract that you've signed to say, you know, final work, you get paid 100%, <laughs> whether it's used or not. So I think a contract is very important. Um, Another, another resource that I use is called, um, there's two girls that do murals in um, San Diego. They're called Pander, P-A-N-D-R. Um, and they're a great resource. They have contracts and outreach um, help. They have just like a, a, just a ton of resources when it comes to muraling. Um, and one clause um, that I'll share um, that's in their mural contract is, is there's like a 25% clause. Like let's say you have your design like Mike here and it does change, you know, up to 25% that's allowed just because, you know, you're looking at it on a screen and from a screen to a wall can change. Just being, you know, this screen here will look different than your phone and, you know, it'll look different depending on the light situations too. Mm -hmm. So 
um, and just being that like you know Mike did change like the dots are different in, in the initial sketch so there's like that allowance to make that kind of change yeah you don't realize you need a contract until you need a contract <laughs> that's what you'll learn so I'd say be proactive sometimes clients will come to you with a contract like I think AU Arts came with a contract which is good but you want to make sure you read it too right like I used to you know it's almost like the Apple terms where you just scroll and go okay and that most of the time it's fine with clients but sometimes you can get trapped in a situation too where there's there's something about revisions. Didn't happen with AERs. AERs contract was great, but you know, like stuff about revisions, putting in your contract, like I will provide one revision at this scale, um, or and I that, and additional <laughs> revisions will cost X amount an hour. Yeah, totally. Um, so I've had that happen where I'm like, wow, I should have put something in about revisions, but I just had one too. Yeah, where we. I didn't have a contract and it seemed like it was all going good. And then we got into it about rights because there's also something with your images um, and your videos and stuff where it's like rights, you know? When you make an image for someone, are you giving them the rights to own this image? Are you giving them the rights to print this image for a certain amount of time? That kind of thing. And I didn't even realize that was a problem until it happened and it took a whole year for us to resolve it. So you definitely want to check out the Graphic Designers Guild. Um, they have the the handbook. I don't know, it has a yeah. really long name, but Graphic Designer Guild. Graphic. Graphic Artist Guild. Graphic Artist handbook. Guild. Uh, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Lavelle, and this is Hey. Well, it, with murals, it's um, generally it's by the square foot. So it, usually it's like between 30 to 50, I would say. I think Bump does $50 a square foot. Uh, actually, it's more like $8 is kind of like the square foot. Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh, never mind. That's very high. Don't listen to me. <laughs> I'm charging a lot. Uh, that's good, though. And they usually ask me if I can go cheaper, so. <laughs> um, when I started off, I was uh, taking a lot of the time whatever they gave me, which it's always good to, I always find it's good to quote a little higher and then go down instead of quoting low and there being like the what if I could have charged more because I'm doing a lot of work actually. Um, getting half of the payment up front or deposits good too, that protects you. So like taking like, oh, like I just did a bump mural this year and I think they paid 30% up front and that protects you and then the rest. I don't know, $8 a square foot for murals? You well, know I better think, than I me. I think um, bump has kind of, kind of normalized um, that $8 is kind of like kind of the bottom where, because I mean, it, like for myself, I charge upwards to $30 a square foot, but I kind of have a scaling system. So basically if I have a larger square footage, let's say it's 4,000 square feet, it can scale all the way down to eight dollars a square foot because no one's going to want to spend a hundred thousand dollars for a mural. Um, and I just, I mean, unless you're like Shepherd Ferry or something <laughs> crazy like yeah. that, and you have that name. But you know, just kind of a, a local artist, it kind of. But I think those those two kind of questions kind of, or those two points kind of go hand in hand. Like for me, for every project, I always get a deposit mm -hmm. and also have a signed contract, mm -hmm. so that way you know, you're kind of protected if, you know, your client's willy-nilly and just wants to back out. And, you know, I, I, I don't know if this will make you feel any better, but I, to this day, I still struggle with pricing. Yeah. I mean, I've been doing it for 10 years, and I still, there's still, it's usually with, like, with muraling, it's just, it's, this is what I charge per square foot, and it's pretty run-of-the-mill. And then, you know, rentals for lift equipment, or, you know, if it's a gnarly wall, like cinder block, or just really gnarly brick, that's, you know, that you can add a surcharge for the, those kind of things, or if it's you know 160 feet in the sky and you need a particular type of certification um, or scaffolding, uh, where was I going with that point? Um, but yeah, like with every new project, like like for for instance, um, like I had a client reach out wanting to do like uh, a character and they wanted it for their brand, and it's really like 
well, is it about licensing? Do you want it for mm -hmm. apparel? Mm -hmm. Like, cause that, that's kind of when things get kind of, that's where I go to the, uh, the graphic artist yeah. book and I kind of use that as a reference guide for anything that I'm, I'm familiar with. And I mean, usually I'll go to the client like, hey, what's your budget? Yeah. Is your, you know, usually you'll be able to tell whether they're serious or agencies, like if you're working with agencies, they usually have like, okay, well my budget's $2,000. Can you do an illustration in this time? So, and that's another thing, if it's, they're asking for work less than two weeks, I always charge 25% rush fee. Mm. So that just goes on top of the quote. And I think there's something to say too about like, if it's a, if there's something like, my first mural, did I get paid what I'm charging now? No, but it was a, it was a big opportunity for me to get into that. So if it doesn't like feed you, it has to feed like an opportunity or feed your soul too, if it's something you really want to do, but definitely try and get paid your worth and don't be afraid to ask for what you're worth. If they can't pay it, you can negotiate if that's what you want to do, or you can walk away. I've learned saying no for low paying stuff too is okay. There's other opportunities. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I did a poster for Split Island and it pays very little, but it was just, I just love music and I love, you know, gig posters and it was just something I've always wanted to do. So that was kind of like, I ate the, the fee to be able to participate. Mm -hmm. Just because I wanted to do it, fed my soul. Yeah. Cool. Well, we have like three minutes. I think we can go do our walk. Yeah.